Oh, what? One, two, hey ho, one, two. Okay, everything might fall apart at any second, but that's okay, because this is rock and roll. And ironically, it's what the album's about. Um, okay, yes, I feel good about today, because this is Art of Rock. Hi, welcome. Um, I hope that's live. Having a bit of computer problems, as always. We're going to jump straight into this. Uh, Rezzy, we're going to talk about old school sequencing and fun stuff like that. Rezzy, tell me about your experience with old school sequencing. Go. I joined the party at a little bit later generation than truly old school. So we're going to talk like some sort of um, high water mark of, of MIDI sequencing, I think. Um, definitely way after step sequencers that were built, uh, you know, with, with analog parts. Definitely way after digital sequencers that were their own standalone units and uh, you know uh, had a two line by 20 character display and definitely after the first round of midi only sequencers that ran on, on apple twos and atari sts and now we're talking like actual 1988 macintosh studio vision performer i think cubasis existed at the time so Going back to those, that is where I figured out how to like make, make a song completely in um, the so time what, period. What in, you in, used a Mac? What did you use? Um, my first one that I got for going to college was an SE30, uh, and I upgraded the RAM and I got the you know an internal hard drive upgrades and. Um, there's an external video card support. Like I really used the hell out of that thing. Um, so it's grayscale, 512 pixel monitor. But the software that I adopted first was Studio Vision um, or Vision Opcode Vision. And one of the the saddest stories in 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 music is the the the, um, the company that owned Gibson bought Opcode sometime in the late 90s, I guess, and just shit can it it's gone yeah, they, they closed it and apparently the the computers that ran the source yeah they just they let them rot and nobody got the, the code and nobody's written a sequencer quite like it since although digital performer and cubase are certainly as capable and logic um emagic at the time that was also contemporary but one of the things about working in this way it's a long way of getting to this is you had um unlimited number of sequences. There wasn't just a document that you'd be looking at and that's your song. There was no state of, you know, um, all of your linear timelines are one thing at a time and you sort of focus on that. You could have tracks that contain MIDI, tracks that contain eventually audio, tracks that contained sequences in their own right. And in those sequences, of course, there would be, you know, deeper nested things like tracks of any length, tracks that would loop arbitrarily, two bars, four bars, three bars for, you know, polyrhythms. And the flexibility of that, I haven't found, and I think the discussions sort of tapered off around 2016, of anybody even hoping for something like this to, to come back into existence. Please correct me if I'm wrong, and there are things that do this. But what it afforded you is there was an object that was like 16 tracks of your drum part, and you could collapse that down to be an object and put that in your song. So there were instances of verse drum part was fantastic because if you wanted to modify verse drum part you just open up that sequence and now you put the kick on four instead of two and it propagated to all the places that that was referenced so working in ableton live there is no such thing as referencing a subsequence with sequences inside it it just doesn't exist so what i i think most people do is you've got a drum part in the verse and you color it pink so you recognize it and name it verse drums and then eventually you're going to want to change something about it. You just copy, paste, paste, paste into all the places you used it. And hopefully you keep track or keep it labeled or something like that. But there's no, there's no concept of, of these subsequences and instances and uh, cloned clips. And I don't know. I think I, I wanted to one rant a little about that since you encouraged me to <laughs> take the floor. I love this. This is great. And two, what are the ways around it? I mean, I know that everybody has written songs, no problem with modern sequencers and don't require nested subsequences and, 
um, the like. But what, you know, short of, well, just use a analog step sequencer and modulate your patterns in real time and record that. Like that's that's a awesome way of doing it too. But for the traditional, I'm writing a pop song and six months later, I want to come back to it and move the kick drum in the verses, every verse, because I like where it falls. Now, how do you do that? Um, okay. I started this fantastic journey in 1990 on an Atari ST1040 FM. And uh, I started on Pro 12. I actually bought Pro 12. It was like hundreds of dollars. Then I figured out you could get it for free. Thanks. And when you're a student, hundreds of dollars is a lot. But it was really interesting that I ran out of 12 tracks very quickly. Um, and uh, I, um, I'll try not to run it. Um, there was something magical about Pro 12 with all of its limitations. Firstly, the timing on an Atari ST1040 and ST1040 uh, FM was so... It was solid. It was so... It was clockwork solid. I also had the Midex thing, so I could break out to, like, 96 MIDI channels. And I had most of them revving with, contro with controllers and stuff, and it didn't hiccup. My computer now that is probably several million times faster hiccups although there is a bit of audio going on in there too but um at 96k 24 4 bit wow i sounded like such a dickhead just then um yeah i found that yeah uh then i went to pro 12 uh pro 24 and then i got a monochrome monitor and went to cubase um and i've been using cubase ever since so for over 30 years i've been using fucking cubase um, and, uh, I absolutely love Cubase. If I want to put kicks on all four, I go through and put kicks on every single four. I've experimented with, so Cubase has got a thing in it called a range mode where you can do that, but I hardly ever use it. And what's pathetic and is pathetic about me is that the amount that I'm using Cubase as far as MIDI programming, etc., is probably as much of, if not less than what I was using in the nineties when I had more hair. Um, and um, that actually increased updates with Cubase comes at the cost of hair. Many of you don't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah. Um, it's interesting. I've always thought about those times that I used to do things that were really experimental because I didn't have X, Y, and Z, but I wanted to make it sound like I had X, Y, and Z. So I'd, um, I'd bullshit my way through so many things. And I really, I really miss, um, you know, so many of the things I used to do. Uh, you know, it's funny, I found Emacs discs from that time that still worked. And I went through them and I went, these are so mean. Like, they're really, like, in order for me to make that kick drum sound more fucky, I just turned up the, the, the gain inside the Emacs. So I distorted the data. So it sounded brutal. Um... But I use Cubase, and I don't, um, I've tried other software, it doesn't really do it for me. I guess the thing about Cubase is it's, it's so baked into my brain that it's just a language for me now. It's an extension of a language. But, um, if I could, yeah, um, so an answer is I don't, because for me it's like, it's, it's, it's never just four on the floor, and the verses are never the same, because I've got to put a, I'll put a little fill at the end of that four bars, and then two bars into that one, I'm going to have this weird stop thing. So I have to do everything by hand. Um, because for me to try to replicate what a real drummer would do. So once upon a time, we had these things called real drummers. And they were grown in tanks, these huge bathtubs. Um, and they would shiver and shake. And they'd be born. When they born out, they, they would come out wearing black cloth which we'd have to sew into clothes. Um, and some of their bones that would come out, like additional bones, we would craft them into drumsticks. And we would just wheel them in, in, in their little hyperbaric thing, and um, drop the working link into your Patreon. Um, it is. Ivan? Um, Ivan, hold on, I'm, I'm getting Ivan. Ivan loves to talk about this stuff. Um, hold on, hold on. Where the hell is the link? I'm just going to put it in the... Um, anybody else is welcome to jump, uh, jump in. Uh, I just wanted to d d state a little workflow tip. Um, 
and this is it's kind of hard to articulate without a visual and and actually learning it for a few months but say track one has just sequences track one is a lengthy chain of verse chorus verse chorus verse chorus and within that is drums bass and uh arpeggio synth then track two in this sequence hey whoa just, what all of that stuff in the one track track wow. two now is the bass line that i just laid down funky fucking dank groove track three is vocal comped from other takes so if i wanted to modify verse drums bass I forgot what I said. Oh, arpeggio. Yeah. I just double click the sequence that's in the track. It becomes its own window. And now I'm working in that sequence and it plays in time and it remains synchronized to the main sequence timeline. If you wanted to, if it's the same tempo even. And um, so then you can, if you want to not just reference that, like you're saying, do it by hand, you can orphan off the other versions of that um, verse subsequence and have them become their own instant their own standalone um instances so mm, i don't know uh it's, it's crazy well, well yeah but the um actually no cubase used to have a thing called ghost tracks um i don't even I know if they that. still have ghost tracks but basically a ghost track was a thing where you would derive a whole bunch of things off a master track a master midi track and every time you copied the ghost track if you change the master one, the ghost tracks would reflect that because they were, in fact, just reflections of that track. That um, is so powerful. To be yeah, able to do. but I don't do that. Um, and I always found myself, because if you double clicked on it, you went and you changed that ghost track, everything would change. Um, so, uh, but no, there are ways around it. And Cubase also has a range. Wow, I just remembered ghost track. The, and Vince, the other thing sorry, that I do um, before Vince jumps in is if you wanted a part to have like an extra fill and you didn't want them all to be the same, just make a new track in the subsequence. That's the extra kick or the extra Tom fill. And there you've got your, your variations built into that. And uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, you know, a lot of this kind of grooves around to um, analog sequencing, but I want to get to that later right now. I want to hear the words of Vince who just started a Kickstarter. Hey, hold on events <clears throat> while you're there. Um, everything's working again. Uh, follow Vince's Patreon. That's right. There, everyone. Vince, go. Hi. Um, okay, you're using Ableton, right, Raz? Absolutely. Okay. Well, Ableton's, I believe it's Session View, whichever view it is that gives you, like, all the tracks. Nobody can repeat that twice. Nobody knows which is Session and which is Arrange. Yeah, I, I can't remember. But whichever one of those works basically almost the same as, as acid as far as arranging tracks and, and that and I use acid. So if you take your track that you want to change it your your verse sequence, right? Make your verse sequence just those bars. Just however many bars your verse is. Then when you put it in your track, copy and paste that where you want it. And then when you edit the kick on the verse, it'll edit every single one of them with one motion to be able to edit that because I do everything in the box. I don't use a hardware device for sequencing. So that's the way I handle it. So it batch edits essentially because you've only got the eight to 16 bars or whatever at a time in there. That is absolutely how I do it. I fully agree with that. And it's a good insight. Um, where it falls apart is Ableton doesn't handle the clips view grid along with full length track uh, performances as elegantly as it would need to. Interesting workaround. This doesn't quite work either, but it's, it's a fun trick. If you do um, assign a MIDI note to trigger off that, that group of, of, of clips called a scene, you can put a MIDI note in the linear track view assign that MIDI note to be the trigger for that scene and loop back MIDI into itself to trigger it off and get effectively, um, you know, you name that, that the, the MIDI clip containing that note, uh, trigger the verse and it'll say MIDI C3, assign your scene one to MIDI C3. And then every time Ableton loops back MIDI to itself to trigger off scene one, which is assigned to MIDI note C3, it'll play that exact thing that you're talking about and it is a way of doing um you do that with the verse you do that with the chorus you do that with the bridge and like you'll have essentially that but it doesn't 
pick it up midway through the sequence. You have to trigger it off from the top of the 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 part. So it's not like you can just jump in in the middle of your verse and have it in the session view, um, a range view, grid view um, clips no. stay in sync. It but doesn't give you it doesn't give you a piano roll with your your uh, session or whichever one is the you know all the shit like I said. I can't versus remember. grid view. Yeah, no, it does. It it fully does. But things that are in the um, grid view get triggered from the top or gated from different ways, but they don't play from the middle doing it this way. So if you're doing this, like tricking it to MIDI loop back itself to trigger them off, say bar one is where you're, you're or bar three, beat four, beat four, so that it'll actually pick it up on bar four, beat one. Um, it'll play beautifully if you played from before bar four, beat one, but if you play after bar four, beat one, bar four, beat two, it's not going to trigger off that clip and it won't play it linear in sync as you scrub or jump around. It'll only trigger it off as a boom, one time event, play it through. And it'll stay in sync, of course, because it's clocked, but it doesn't do as if they're all of the same uh, master clock or the same timeline. They'll be independent timelines, which can be super powerful if you want it. But if you don't want it, it's just, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't quite do it. But so close, yeah. Um, the, 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 the trick is to sort of stay in a range grid view for as long as you can when you're doing this sort of dicking around with parts and you know coming up with combinations of stuff that's what it's for but the minute you start jumping over to trying to bridge grid view and linear view you do run into these um master clock versus triggered event kind of discrepancies and it's just like ah not the way i was raised but you know obviously powerful in its own way this is really interesting. Uh, this conversation is really inspiring me. Uh, when I hear people talk about um, Ableton and other software, it really makes me, because there's some great things about Ableton. I just, my brain doesn't work with Ableton. Um, it's brilliant software. And I've said to so many people, get to know Ableton. Um, uh, it, it's interesting. I, I'm, I get really inspired to try other things on Cubase, like try live approaches to writing and stuff. Cubase can probably do that now. I'm still on version 5. It's on version 11 or something. Um, I got the weirdest bug on Cubase this week. Man, I got this bug that it was only playing the audio if you had the cycle button on. And it wasn't playing where the head was. It was playing 20 and a half bars earlier. Um, and it was like... And you know that song that I've been working on that I've been bitching about endlessly? I was trying to put that fucking song down for the final mix and I got it down and then I sent it to the mastering guy and I was so happy and then I listened back to it and went, nope, still not there. <laughs> and I think Cubase fucked with it somehow. So I said stop and he went, all right. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, I hijacked that. Yeah, it's really interesting, like like the different uh, ways that you can get all of this stuff done. Like, like um, Ableton is such a great tool to use it seems to be great for getting ideas down and also interacting with them quickly. Like, you've got to know it. Like, all of this triggering stuff via MIDI notes, that's brilliant. Vince, go. Uh, I had another thought while we're on the subject of MIDI. He said something about uh, sequencing MIDI things in general. And what it made me think of was this. If you're at a loss for inspiration or you need something to do different things that maybe you're not thinking of start with old like 90s hip hop samples that's great run it through your software turn it into a midi track and then edit out parts of it so that it changes it so you're no longer ripping off the 90s hip hop sample you've created something entirely new out of it out of different sounds even because you can change the sounds through the midi software that tends to be a great way to come up with rhythms and melodies when you're stuck. That's a really good idea. Um, something I'm doing... Oh, uh, uh, Ivan, please. So, uh, the whole session uh, versus arrangement you in, in Ableton, what I usually do, you know, like my workflow is build, a, build parts in the session view. And then uh, uh, 
builds scenes in session view. So I can just play a scene, run through it once, make sure it doesn't sound like crap, uh, make sure it's working for me. And then when I convert that to you know a song, I, I start copying and pasting you know the clips out of session view into the arranger view. And then from there, you, you can you know, change the size and shape of a particular session. So you can get around the like, you know, playing or starting in the middle because you just chop that off. Um, and then, you know, just lay that out on the timeline, uh, get everything to where I'm happy. And then, you know, when I'm happy with how it sounds, then I will just freeze everything and, you know, start doing exports of, of stems. That's brilliant. Is it, uh, you know, largely, it largely works, work that works most of the time for me. I mean, yeah, you know, every once in a while having to jump back and forth between them gets a little frustrating. That's almost kind of annoying. Like, I, I would like to find a way to have both windows open at the same time. That's the one thing Ableton doesn't do that, holy crap, like, they could make it infinitely more powerful if you could see both of those both of those views at the same time. Because I've got enough window you know real estate. Can. Now. You know you can now. What? You can have second window. Yeah, but it's it's you know second and... it's second window. Uh, if you change views in second window, let's, let's just let's just second window one has the grid, one has the timeline. Okay. Does that work now? Yeah. See, what? oh, imagine oh, now. Oh crap! It does now. <laughs> I have not I have not retried this in such a long time. I had no idea. Oh, oh, oh and my life just got way better. Hey. Um, but what you're hitting on, like, imagine if you never had to have that frustration of um, orphaning the uh, grid view when you put it into timeline view. If the things that you popped into the timeline were still instances of those scenes and you could still edit in the scene view and they would propagate to the individual places in the timeline I, I, that would be that we would be super handy if we could you could label something in the in the scene view and you know any change that happens there just happens across yep. locally and across. if you want it to not you just make a, a copy of the scene now you've got verse yeah. two and verse two yeah. and verse one yeah. are separate instances now yeah no because like because i'm already doing that um being able to just have oh, if i could just edit it in one place and have it be everywhere that'd be so nice it's not, you know, right now it's really normal to be like, oh, I need to change out this part. And then I end up, you know, like copying it and just pasting it back across the timeline yes. everywhere it belongs and, and hoping I don't forget a spot. You know, I was thinking, um, this is great. And I'm, I thank you guys for it. I, I think, I feel like after Out of Rock, everybody needs to make a pledge that I'm going to give myself two hours just to play with my gear. Like, you know, because right now I'm just going, wow, I'm so inspired, I'm so inspired. And then I'm going, I've got all this stuff I have to do, but I'm so inspired. Um, I think we need to try and start doing this, uh, you know, because I know, like, often you and uh, Vincent Razzi pull out, you know, your guitars and stuff. I think that's great. Um, big hi to everyone in the chat. Um, today's more like therapy. I like it. Vince, go. Um, just uh, a quick thought. Also, after the Zoom, I had a couple other thoughts I want to discuss with uh, Carl specifically because it's this is his thing essentially, um, and whoever else is maybe interested. But I, I, I have thoughts on things we're doing. Oh, okay, cool. Group. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that for sure, for sure. Um, uh, thank you, and we will do that. Um, and I will stay for a while for quite a while. Does anybody else, like, here's a question. <clears throat> when you MIDI program, how hardcore intricate do you get into MIDI? Like, how hardcore, how much are you fucking with controllers and velocities and the groove of it? How much time do you spend in MIDI before you dedicate it? I mean, you know, if you're using soft sense, you don't need to dedicate it to, to <clears throat> dedicate it to tape. You can, you can leave it there, and that's great. Uh, sometimes I wish, God damn it, I wish I could do that in a mix. Let me tell you. Um, but in MIDI land, specifically, how much time do you spend in MIDI land? Resi. Um, this goes right back to my preamble rant and what Ivan was saying about um, 
moving from a fluid state to a sort of a more fixed permanent state. I don't. Like, I'm in MIDI land, preferably through the mix. This is, I don't like there to be a break between, and many people need this, um, composing and mixing. The mix is going to be mostly done by the time the song is written in this case. And mm, I'll do an alternate version that's completely different, perhaps. But the process of writing the song is the process of mixing. And therefore, some of my MIDI controllers, continuous controllers, some of my like, maybe there's a program change, probably not. But all of the expression stuff, all of the things that are mapped to change the filter cutoff or change the um, LFO depth for the vibrato. They're all nuanced and editable. And if they become a distraction six months later, when I open the thing up for the very final mix, blip, little tweak, it's fine. Totally do it. It's a way to never get anything done also. And I realize that I should state, but to be able to recall a thing a couple years later and, you know, like make a change or, or borrow the um, automation curve that you drew for the um, filter sweeps and apply that to something else for the remix or alternate version. You know, it's always it's always there. So it's like never really leaving MIDI land, leaving all the virtual synths live, printing the external ones probably because, you know. All right, can I ask you another? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, how long, because then I want to go on a rant um, about how much my, uh, the, my flow has changed in Angel Spit, um, when you um, uh, so for example, your external hardware MIDI stuff, how soon before the mix uh, d does that stuff get printed? I sometimes leave the synths live for months, like literally, just leave them going. And if the cat walks on it, oh well. But how <laughs> long? They're off it. though. You turn them off though, don't you? No, some of mine that I don't. Like the CP70, like that thing takes no power. I leave it on. The Pro One, I generally leave on. Things that are you like. You leave it on for off. months? Literally yeah, turned mean, on at the wall with electricity running through it for months. Yes, literally. Wow. But not my digital sense that have memories like JX3P and the JX8P and the memory mode when I have that. Those all, I just store the patch. And they used up enough power that it was stupid and expensive and eco hostile to leave them all on. But I'm down to things that are just using a trickle. And if they're parts that I'm actively working on for a few weeks and I say months because that happens, absolutely leave, yeah, yeah, just leave them on. I mean, the electronics are happy being in a state of constant temperature as long as it's not overheating. It's the heating and cooling and turning on and off that tend to flex your phenolic and solder and stuff. and. Oh yeah, no, no. It's it's temperature fluctuations that are dangerous for the equipment. Yeah, uh, I they used to generate charts and graphs for data centers, and I could predict when hard drives were going to fail just based on when I saw a spike and what it looked like. I was like, oh, we're going to lose we're going to lose a couple of hard drives in about ten days. <laughs> Thank you for that corroboration. Um, it is uh, it, the also, thing. About also, leaving uh, leaving your analog gear just shut off for too long is really, really, really bad for it. Closet stored, you know, uh, uh, Juno 106. You know, it sat in the closet for 10 years. You'd think, you know, oh, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Except, you know, the caps are freaking breaking yeah, down they're, because they're not getting warmed up. Well, you have electrolytes all over your surfboard. Yeah. Wow. But the the, sh the shorter shorter way of answering. Uh, wait, were we still on? Yeah. How long do you leave your synths on? Like, like do synths actually make it into the mix stage for you? Yeah, there's a point at which it becomes ridiculous, and I'm like, no, I'm really married to way the, the way that this bass line is, is working right now. The LFO is lined up on the filter sweep is just good. Print it, and then I can turn the synth off. But I'm always like, oh, I kind of wanted to change that. Oh, well, here it is. And then I'll find another way to change it, like, you know, add a uh, modularly add a filter after it that's triggering off the, you know, clock instead of off the internal clock on the synth. So it's it, it varies, but I do tend to err on the side of leaving everything editable and fluid and changeable through the entire flow uh, jamming to mix, which exceptions being like just putting a quick demo down. I mean, obviously that's just going to be, you know, printed and, and recalled, but 
at some point during during the song, you get into that moment when you've got a lot of things going and everything's cooking, and your MIDI tracks are still MIDI, and you haven't printed any of the external synths, and that could go for weeks easily. So, and with cool. the with my with my hardware synths, it's a, uh, you know, they, 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 they everything stays pretty loosey goosey, but always getting recorded until I am happy with you know the patch and the and the and the, the and the, and the MIDI that has happened. You know, so the notes are all in the right order. The timing is all good. The patch is good. I'm happy with it now. Then I will print, you know, just print the audio of it, drop that down into the audio, like have an audio track just dedicated to what I have played, shut off the, the MIDI track for it, and then anything that's happening to it after that is going to be in software anyways. So, you know, just keep it in software at that point. And, and it's usually, usually that works out because by then, that part is okay. Fascinating. Um, Vince, I want to throw it to you. Can I go in after you, Vince? <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yeah. Casey, thanks. Um, another thing, if you, uh, I mean, leaving things plugged in and on to keep things saved is, is a great way to do that. But uh, I feel like, I don't know, maybe it goes without saying, considering, you know, all of us use digital production and computers to, finish things at least because uh, we have to for distribution reasons and that's the way the whole world works as far as digital art content goes um, but when you're done with things even if you don't save your settings or your, your EQ sweep or your automations you can always go into the box later and maybe EQ and change and add effects to that that make it do different things in your software in your in your DAW, so that you don't necessarily need to have that saved because you can do other things with it that wouldn't be accomplished by changing the things you already did, but instead adding other effects to that that may or may not even necessarily be available on your hardware. Hmm. All right. Um, okay, so I just want to quickly... Uh, Rob's in the chat. Um, Rob said he can't leave anything on because he's of the lightning storms. Rob's in Florida. Makes sense. Um, I prepare sequences on the Novation Mark III uh, to drive hardware since I play with the synth setting on a few playbacks and record uh, to external digital sequencer. Sometimes I record the MIDI also. Uh, Akai S550, fuck off Norton, uh, is a different story. Same for Motif, which is done predominantly on the hardware. Um, here's something really interesting is that I um, I will go through MIDI stage, where everything's powered up, and, um, uh, and then once I'm happy with it, I dedicate it to sequencer, I dedicate it to, to hard drive. It's really interesting that in early al albums, due to um, uh, shortcomings in in technology, they were all recorded. I think they were recorded the first Angel Spit and second Angel Spit album. I think were done at forty four uh, bit sixteen bit uh, sixteen bit forty four point one, um, which is preposterous when I think about it. Um, then the, the, after that, it was uh, uh, twenty four bit. Sorry, a 24-bit uh, 44.1. I went up to 24-bit. And then for Hello My Name Is, uh, it went up to 96K. 96K 24-bit. And that's stellar difference. The issue I had in the early albums is that I didn't have the... Um, uh, I didn't... Uh, the, the, the hard drives weren't strong enough to allow me to have all of this stuff dedicated to tape. So um, it was mainly vocals and guitars. Um, because when I look back at the old files, um, it's just vocals, guitars, um, and um, the vocals process is all done externally, then recorded. Um, uh, and the guitars were all, this is how the guitars were with a bit of um, you know, EQ and a little tiny bit of compression. Um, no side chaining. Um, but everything else was on the K2000s or the Jupiter 8s, and they were played in live, and everything got mixed to the... I had an O1V, 
And I also had an 01V card in the computer as well, which was fucking great. So everything would um, then... I, I would record them in real time on the computer down to a master track. Um, and it was just fascinating how that approach uh, changed the music. Um, it, because I'm always thinking how... I'm concerned that it's become too easy and I'm trying very hard. It's really weird. I'm trying to make it harder and more difficult for myself because I have this theory that the harder it is, the more time you spend going back reviewing and you touch stuff up, you know? Even if it doesn't need it, you'll go through and you'll just add little highlights here and there um, because the paint's still dry. Uh, it's still wet. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, I guess, sure, you can tweak stuff, but I don't know. It's just a thing I've noticed in myself, like how as technology's got better, I, f excuse me, I am concerned I've got lazier. Um, and I work so hard to make music sequencing and everything production amazing. Like it, it doesn't go out unless it's amazing, unless it's a hit. I don't release it. Um, but I feel like I'm getting lazier. I can't... And then it's it's funny because then I listen to other music. You know, I've got, you know, empty VTV on all the time. I've got, um, you know, I'm going through the, the Spotify playlist of our stuff and then that suggests other stuff. And I listen to that other stuff and I go, there's not a lot happening here. And that, you know, also breeds into another um, argument of there doesn't need to be anything, too many things happening. Sure, that's great, but... Um, I guess my thing is that when, you know, when I'm looking for something deep, terrifying and challenging in the music, um, I, for me, that comes through a long process of toil. And I always, you know, I think the anguish that I face, that the anguish that helps me make music is in the process of actually making music. It's not my life. Yeah, I can't, if my life's fucked, I can't make music. However, the process of music makes me so angry, makes me so fucking lose my mind. That's where the angst is that will empower me to make good music. If that makes sense, Razzie, help me. The thing that you just touched on a second ago with the, the, the process early on, um, it, it just dawned on me how much that informs what I was talking about, about leaving everything live, you know, until the end, where just to put a really fine point on it, you had a sequencer driving some synthesizers, going through some effects in your mixer. Sequencer doesn't record audio. The mixer is a stereo mixer. It's going to end up as two tracks. And, and it's you, empty, but go on. Maybe, maybe. I mean, I, I, I'm saying you've only got two tracks. Say you've got a cassette or a reel-to-reel -reel or a DAT, and it's 1993 or something. I don't know what year it is. But you, you're not talking about going to the studio. You're just talking about your home project studio where you're writing this stuff. Sequencer, driving a bunch of synths that go into a mixer. you got a couple of reverbs. you got your Elisis uh, MIDI verb. you got your SPX-90. You got a delay and a reverb. And a, maybe, maybe a couple of 3630s for compression. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, but but I have a couple of early singles from that time period that made it from demo to recording where it was sung live. You do multiple takes. You play the backing tracks and MIDI sequencers and MIDI sequences into MIDI keyboards into your mixer and then yeah, 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 sing along with it until you get a good take. And I, I think a couple of the earlier things were, were finished that way. Um, yes, if you're really advanced, you could take your cassette four track, put one track with time code, turn off DBX on track four so that it doesn't squelch it. Um, or L, your LTC or, or MTC or whatever you've got on there and then hopefully your sequencer will slave to that properly and pick up the, uh, you know, the synchronization. And then you can actually do some rudimentary editing and punching in on your vocal track rather than just doing the single performance. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm getting a little in, in the weeds of nostalgia there, but yeah, the, the, the basic thing of having learned to do this full song thing with the limitations being 
your MIDI sequencer into the keyboards that you owned into a mixer, into your two track master version of that entire performance. Sort of, I guess, really <laughs> stuck around. It runs, runs deep. It's, um, you know, st st still an influence. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and also the way that it actually changed the, the songwriting process and what you were coming out with, what you were yielding musically um, because obviously it's going to change. I mean, like, you know, if you drive from California to F Florida in a FJ, in a fucking Charger from 1974 versus a Tesla, you're going to have two very different road trips. Um, and um, they're both going to be awesome, probably. But uh, uh, my point is that I, I constantly wonder, like, and try to pay homage and try to recapture the feeling of I don't know what the fuck I'm doing right now um that that th the opportunity of of something amazing happen is outside drop down menus on on your key on, on your on your software um so yeah uh, I don't know it's just a really interesting thing that I always find myself going how can I you know, how can I, how can I do something different here? Yeah. And how can I go back? Like old keyboard magazines from the, from the late eighties, early nineties, um, especially the ones where they talk about in the, in the mid late nineties, where they were talking about setting up your home studio. Um, like they're mind blowing to me. They're so inspiring because it's, um, you know that's where I was like like the the magic of oh my god I have a I have a studio in my bedroom, more the point I have a bed in my studio, um, but yes it's 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 a really interesting thing and I I don't know I just yeah it's it's good good please somebody talk I'm uh, working on a reinterpretation right now that um, funny I I. I the topic comes up at an appropriate time for that. Um, but I guess that's why it was on my mind where it's um, kind of doing like this idea of like a profit five, uh, SH one Oh one or something. And a, um, I don't know what's the other synth, maybe a, a Jupiter. And those are the three synths that I kind of have. And I'm sort of sticking to that, even though they're just like massive and analog, the, uh, the built-in synth on Ableton Live. But I'm, I'm envisioning them as, as with those limitations. And they have, uh, you know, a, a MIDI track and an arpeggiator. And, and it's the yeah, S707. Yeah, actually. Well, I think it's an LM1 in this case, but pretty damn close. Dude, actually, I did instantiate a 707 on this one. That's, a, that's an awesome call. Oh, well, the 707s are great. Uh, I'm sorry, keep going. No, no, they're, 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 they're similar. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm temping it with, with the original like sampled drum parts right now, but I totally dropped a 707 as the, uh, the placeholder. You know, that's, that's so funny. Um, and they, uh, go ahead. between Alan 1 and 707, but yeah. Um, great thing about the 707 and the 727 is they distort really well. Um, they're not my favorite of like, you know, obviously Lin drums and SP 12s are brilliant fucking, um, absolutely brilliant because you could detune them and all sorts of things. But see, that's a really fantastic, you know, I think to say is that, okay, you're going to feed the trig output from your drum machine into your SH-101 and that's going to be going boom, 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 boom. So every time you, you, you move your, your finger, it's going to be a different like pulsing key, or you might set it up with a little sequencer or something or an arpeggiator or something. Um, and the verses are all going to be on, uh, because you can split the Jupiter 8 keyboard, is going to be on the bottom part of the Jupiter 8 keyboard. And then when it gets into the chorus, you're going to be playing the melody on the top part of the Jupiter 8 keyboard. And the core, all the pads are coming off the Jupiter 8 keyboard. And there's this massive mono unison lead line coming off the fucking Pro 5. Um, that's, because that's like, you know, man, when I started, I had a, Dr. Rhythm 110 drum machine DR110 that I ran the trig out into my SH101 which is still somewhere and with my CZ3000 and it was brilliant because it was so simple 
and I had no sequencing, no nothing. I had to write it all down on a piece of paper. Um, you know, and y you were focusing on the actual, you focused on two things, what notes were going down and what the sounds sounded like. And you weren't focusing on EQing, compression, all of this other stuff. Like it wasn't, um, you know, but, you know, different people have different ways of doing it. I guess I'm saying is that my, um, yeah, go. Talking about advancing your sequencers or step, um, clock, uh, by patching quarter inch audio cables between between the devices and letting them do their thing just like brought back this whole sense memory of most of what we're talking about is like this insular layer by layer thing that we're doing by ourselves but i have the, this memory of um the sort of acid style remix where one guy had a 303 one guy had an 808 the 808 was just sending the pulses to everything sh101 and um the drums were augmented with something coming off of the sampler S950, and the vocal clips from the original song were triggered um, on an, uh, uh, um, I don't know, maybe the, whatever, uh, a different Akai uh, sampler that had much more storage. But this was all like other people's stuff, and it was like a real jam session where people are like sitting on the floor in the dark with all of their sync lines running together, and everybody just had filter amount, filter sweep. And that was the entire session was just like getting this down with the, ah, oh, it's tweaking. Man. It's yeah, sweet. yeah. Uh, I have a similar memory, but my memory involved people sitting around arguing at each other because somebody bought along a Korg, somebody bought along a Yamaha, somebody bought along a Roland, and none of them bitches talk to each other because one's using Dinstink, one's using 24 PPQ, one's using 16, and the whole thing just went, um, yeah. But, um, no, that sounds bloody awesome. Like that, uh, you know, when you, and that's the great thing about modern stuff is that everything's kind of, kind of, you know, most of those, we don't really use fucking 30, 24 PP cube din sync anymore. It's just, you know, it's pretty straight up. And, you know, going to a jam session with one of those things where somebody goes, this is your, this is your uh, clock. Um... And this is the, the bass drone note. So, boom, boom, if you want. Um, like that. Yeah, it's it's magical, man. It's magical. I, God, I, I would kill to be in a situation again like that. Yes. Yes, there's only so many people I can fit in here, Just unfortunately. That jam is worth too much for anybody to actually own the originals anymore, so. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, luckily, um, uh, it's good that, you know, you, you can take your laptop with USB. Um, I don't know how that would work, though. Uh, but, you know, there's also so many cheap things like, you know, a couple of little dope for bits and you get your blooby blobs going. They've just released something that's a, a whole, an entire synthesizer in the 1.8. Yeah, we spoke about that last week. It's 200 bucks. It's really fucking good. Um... Yeah, and you can do all that shit on it. One little modular thing. But, um, yes. Okay. Uh, the floor is open to anybody else who wants to reminisce or talk about new stuff. I would say that sometime in the next year, we should all end up in the desert with laptops and a uh, Jackery battery pack and just synchronize our things and stick to one drum machine and one filter. Please. Please. I am there. Like future plans. I love it, and we'll fly Alex and um, Alex and uh, uh, Julius in somehow. Um, yeah, that'd be great. That would be fucking great. Um, I've always wanted to do like a spitcon thing, where okay, for the next three days we don't know what's happening, but there's going to be all of this random like we're going to fuck up your clothes, we're going to fuck up your music, we're just going <sighs> to. That would be good. Anyway, we still have time. Um, okay. Give me a subject. Let's go. Yeah, where's he go? As I somewhat jokingly said, I think before we went live, I don't know if this one's going to be a buzzkill or not, but it's a 180 at least. Um, not tax. No, but pretty fucking close. 
Oh, we're not on Facebook, are we today? No, no. But we probably are, but it's all right. They'll cancel me no matter what. <sighs> um, there's, there's two things that are um, on my mind a little bit. And one is um, publishing admin. Like having a pub, I know, okay, <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> Anybody want to weigh in on, on delegating a publisher admin in their distributor versus admining it yourself, which is far cheaper and you never have to give them a cut, but it's also a pain in the ass? Um, I, I have nothing to say on this because all of my experience has been horrendous and horrible. All right, another winner there. Uh, <laughs> how about me? My first big question is, what do they, what do they, what, what value do they actually provide these days? It is a bit of trouble to get all of your um, secondary sync stuff and the stuff from the MLC and your. Um, uh, performing rights organization from other territories, all in line, get them all synchronized with actual ISRCs and actual tracks. And if you give it to like say CD Baby or maybe DistroKid does it too, and say, okay, you're my publishing admin, they take 15% and then chase down all of the things and fill out all the forms for you basically. But um, it's a lot of work to learn the individual systems. And um, as far as like the MLC and your, your performing rights organization goes, takes a lot of time to, to work on their systems and you're only gonna get, you know, six bucks or whatever it is a month or or or, or, or 25 cents whatever um so there is some value in doing it and, and having taken the path the past few months of trying to at least know why it's a pain and what they're offering i can kind of answer that confidently that you will save yourself a lot of trouble and a lot of time to delegate somebody else as your publishing admin if they're not taking too much it such it, as cd baby or Distro kid. Yeah, it'll be like a checkbox. It's not even any sweat on your part. Um, it takes a, a, quite a bit of work, but it, it's also not worth that much if you're not doing 10,000, you know, listens a month or something. So it, I don't know. The amount of work that it, that it takes to do it manually is probably not worth yeah, It's probably not worth it to try to do it manually for, for yeah. people. When the, um, I'm pretty sure these days when you've checked that box at CD Baby or, or you know, DistroKid, what is happening is on the back end, a bunch of software is going off and firing up, uh, firing off against their you know, against a bunch of APIs that actually do like there's no human doing any work involved anymore. There is some amount of manual labor involved in that. The MLC has a bulk form, but their a their API isn't open yet, as far as I know. So it does, and and also if it's like all foreign territories, there you may be a uniform way of submitting the stuff. Yeah. But I don't think it's like an open database that you can just dump stuff even, into. Or even it. that, even that, pretty much turns into a scrape the HTML, and then and then go and submit the HTML. Like like that's once there's five thousand of these to do every day, it becomes. A no-brainer. No, you, you, you give me a hundred, and that's enough for me to. That's yeah. a threshold high enough for me to be like, nah, I'm gonna write software and take care of this for me. Um, so well, that's that's like, what they offer, though. Yeah. Like, yeah, it seems to me like fifteen percent is like they could be a bit more fair. And yeah, you know, again, the, 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 that was the, my take. Now, too many of those like they're, they're I don't think you can get API access if you're just anybody. So even if you're, you'd have to do some no, sort no, of you, book you, screen you, scrape anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, when uh, arranging for API access is actually, you know, if you're just like one guy doing it for yourself, like probably not worth the trouble just because it's just in just enough of a pain. But uh, so I, I would like to say yes to them, but 15% is like, geez, guys, what are you doing for me after you've done that? Because it needs to be something else also. And yeah, it doesn't feel like there's much, like, 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 like there's a whole lot there. That That's my, that's that's what got me into taking the slog and trying to do it myself in the first place, being a little bit cheap and a little bit not wanting to give up my uh, 0.015000 with 15 at the end, you know. Yeah. Um, I feel like, like if they're going to take a percentage, like that, 
if that's the way that's gonna work, you're you're lo- The more money you make, the more money you lose. Um, yes. I like DistroKid for things like for, for that situation because they they handle my distribution and my publishing stuff. Other than what goes through ASCAP, so like, the, the, but that's how I get my ISRC codes to put into ASCAP, so everything gets tracked properly. Um, and it's a flat rate, so I mean, like, if you're if you don't feel like the investment is worth it for you long to, to long term, have your your all of your stuff tracked all the time from the time you, you start doing things. Something like DistroKid, I feel like, is, is a better option because it's a flat rate. They're not taking a percentage of anything. The only percentage you pay is the like banking fees you pay to PayPal to get your money or through your bank. Um, other than that, you get all of your royalties from everything. And the only thing you pay for is the distribution. And if you're making cover songs, there's an extra charge for that. So, and it's a dollar a track for sound scan, which is the, the billboard tracking. But I'm, I'm still on the fence about that. But I like DistroKid for, for publishing and, and, and things because I, I don't have to keep track of anything. I just get an ISRC code, I put it into ASCAP, and the ISRC code links all of my stuff because that's what that's for. Um, DistroKid has the annual fee model rather than the percentage model, which is, if, you, if that's more tolerable, totally cool. Yeah. Um, I, I went with CD Baby because there's no annual fee thing, but their upfront is a little bit more. And I've been using RootNote um, for strictly percentage-based because I was doing some singles and stuff this past year. Um, so I didn't want to pay a, a flat, flat fee, and RootNote was the most flexible and, and best deal. But they don't do publishing admin, so I'm looking back to CD Baby or DistroKid. That's cool info. Thanks, Vince. Personally, um, I think that... Um if you're going to be working for something on music, like if you're actually doing something like admin related, um, you need to be doing it in such a way that it is yielding around about $20 an hour of your time or minimum wage of your time. That's why I will go fucking have at it uh, because I do not have the time to do that stuff. Um, Besides taxes and the endless promotion and da 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 I just cannot... Um, for me, it's about... If I, if I did that, my hourly breakdown for that would be... I would be getting fucking a dollar an hour or something. Um, whereas I can just get... You're basically losing my money to do it yourself rather than pay somebody else to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and my thing about it is that in this business fucking corporate dog thing called angel spit my job is to be primarily is to come up with product creative shit um and that means time and it also means a headspace um and yes i'm giving money to other people but i'm giving money to fucking bandcamp as well um my god don't start me on bandcamp the villains of all villains and everybody's behind them. It's wow. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, um, uh, yeah. I just I just get them to do it because I don't really have time. Um, th- I, there's always that balance: time versus money. You know, it's the same thing with making merch, man. But I won't go into that spiel. Razzy, go. I guess um, some people like this shit. <laughs> inexplicably some people are good at this and can still make their music while they're dealing with it but I think the, the most people that end up knowing this stuff and staying current with it are also doing like secondary revenue streams based on that knowledge like doing lectures or you know whatever South by Southwest uh, speeches or doing a, a bunch of YouTube videos talking about it and I think there's some value in that like for people who can be a um music business YouTuber and musician that releases their own stuff that starts paying to, to know how to admin it. But I don't think that there are very many 
people um, at, at any normal working musician level where it's worth it to do this yourself. It's just, it's do it, do it like Carl does it and let somebody have the 15%. It's too much. Uh, that's great. I'm really glad we talked about that. Thank you so much for bringing it up. I'm really great. Another one. <laughs> Can we do about something else now, please? How about um, the actual so-called waterfall release scheduling before an album? What is the what is that? Release track one. All right. Hits on it. Spotify, whatever. You got your album coming out in six months. Now release track two. S include track one's ISRC on this in an EP. So now you've got lots of spins already logged on tr track one, and track two comes out on an EP with it. Delete track one. Now you've just got the one release. It's cleaned up. Single number three. Put all three pieces, and maybe something else if you want it. Maybe. Paul, are you releasing this to, to streaming media, or are you releasing this to Bandcamp? This is to streaming media for your DSPs from your distributor. Um, Bandcamp's a separate story. Definitely different. Um, and by the time you get to your album, you'll have done this like thing and your album released street date. You've got like, you know, all of your accumulated spins and plays on your thing and it launches with some plays. And I don't know, this is a thing that exists. This is a thing that, that pop musicians and rock musicians and alternative musicians. And Tell us more about that. Tell us actually how to do that. So because you, if you release an EP with two tracks on it and you can only. I got you. Um, the just had to let somebody in the front door. The um, trick is you upload your album with a release date of six months out and you use those pending, not not public, not released yet. Um, and you set the release date for them on the fly. So single number one gets a release date of next week, it comes out, your ISRC is paired with that song, same master, same recording, same version, nothing different, comes out on EP number two with that ISRC, and it'll inherit the plays from when it was just on its own EP. It's the same song as far as the DSPs are concerned. And once you see that it's inherited the plays, you can delete EP one, single number one, and you're on single number two. Single okay. number two now has the plays from one and the new plays that you're getting on two. Do the same for three. So and how do you delete the track? Um, you don't delete the track. You just delete the, the EP, the, the release. Um, so you go you to your agitator and you say, take it down now. Yep. I'm sorry, this doesn't make sense to me. I'm not trying to sell it either i'm just saying it's a thing okay so no okay. apologies needed like, i might i might do it i don't know but all right. I, it is uh, weird all right. this is great because now vince is vince. how this would work say again because if you if you release a track on district kid you can't release the same track twice they won't let you do that no but you can have the same track on separate albums right you can put the same track on separate albums but it's going to get a different isrc on each album their distro kit at least so Doesn't what you happen. want to do is release it on the album like immediately when you're uploading it delete the original release from the streaming services so it gets replaced with the release that's on the new ep mm -hmm. yeah so by whatever mechanism you're you're, you're, you're so like yeah there's there's a little bit of a workaround i i would have to do but i, I get what you're saying that way it inherits the plays so that every time you release the next piece of it, the plays keep going up. Yes. Which gains you traction on the streaming services to get you more plays overall for the whole album and, and if more publicity. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're playing the Spotify game, you can also have each of those opportunities to pitch another editorial playlist opportunity opportunities. So. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I may need to research this. This is not... This is going against what I've... Uh, this is a really interesting thing, and if somebody wants to say, hey, man, here's a really cool thing you should try, I want to try it. Yeah. Um, but I... Uh, this is so very curious, because from my understanding, like, you know, that song um, 
has gonna always have the same ISRC unless it's a remix or a different version. So the computers are gonna go, oh, it's the same song. Um, the thing about this um, Spotify is, I think quite a few is, is that, so I've got a song called A. Once I release A, I can pitch that on Spotify, on Amazon, on blah, blah, blah. Now I'm gonna release a song called B and I'm going to release it with A. Um, I am... So, so they can push B, but they can't push A again. Yeah, they won't They won't accept a track that's already been submitted. In, yeah, in and you can... On DistroKid, there is a way, because I've done this, to, to import A again as it stands without uploading it um, to be a part on, of that thing. You, you can do it. Um pain in the ass but you can do it but then you now want to remove a from the b ep no you want to remove a on its own and keep it on the b ep so that the plays from a translate to the ep that has b on it so that already has however many plays a had when it's released but it has a new track Meaning it already has the traction of the plays from A to carry it through to get it more attention so that as you're going, that's the waterfall effect. It's just pouring more and more traffic into the same thing, but not. It's it's pouring the traffic from the old thing into the new thing. And it will build on itself and accumulate. So okay. by the time your album is fully released, it has all the plays from all the tracks as soon as it's released, which therefore gets you more opportunities through the algorithm to be put places because you already have all the plays. And the way it looks on Apple is the, um, the tracks are grayed out until the release date, but they start filling in on the album page. And the way it looks on Spotify is I think they actually hide the tracks. You don't see them like when your album release is six months out the release date pre-release tracks don't show up but you can do the stuff with the uh pre-saves and, and all those other things that, that happen on spotify um so th there's some other advantages to having this long uh runway to, to album release um having the tracks pre-uploaded and doing things with them rather than waiting till you know a week before release day so the the link that i said is ari's take um ari has a podcast and courses and um, website where he maintains very, very comprehensive and up-to-date lists and comparisons of digital distributors and... His article is on DistroKid was the reason I signed up for DistroKid. There you go. Right. He's, he's, he's fun to watch. Good looking guy, hell of a hair. I'll watch that. Thank you. This is very interesting. If nothing else, it's a like interesting puzzle to like try to execute on if you're really bored with how the whole thing you know, releasing albums works. This is something to do. And it might also give you a little bit of a framework to hang um, your entire record labels release schedule on. And, and, and at least for me, finding these little games to, to do with this stuff is like, okay, now there's, you know, something with rules that I can sort of hook into instead of just like having to come up with my own. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's so, gamified and, and weird. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it. I'll, I'll watch it and I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll see what's going on there. Uh, thank you. That's really interesting. My th the interesting things that's happened with me about playlisting and shit is that it's just happened out of the blue. Um, it's been um, like, uh, and, and what's funny is that sometimes they only like leave you on the playlist for a day. Other times they'll leave you on the playlist for like, you know, I've been on a playlist for like a month now. It's it's great, um, but yeah, I can't. Uh, I don't know how they're. It's another thing I don't understand. I absolutely believe they are people doing it. I, um, because the tracks that I'm getting playlisted are like, ah, oh, I wouldn't expect that one to get playlisted. Does he talk about the new? Um, uh, the campaign thing that Spotify is doing where they're... Oh, fuck, I don't remember what the fuck it's called. A little called. 
the um the canvas things no no yeah yeah canvas but it, it's it's where you pay 30 percent of the royalty for yeah yeah I, i'm you know i just I, i'm this close to doing a i'm not gonna fucking fuck with spotify like i'm just not gonna do it screw them because everything they do is designed to reduce royalties for artists it's crazy like every time they do a thing it's like Mm, here's a way we can give you less. It's like podcasters, they don't have to pay streaming royalties on, so they're pushing podcasts. They're apparently... The, mm, no, I'm not going to cite other things that they're doing, but I know that uh, um, Martin Atkins has been ranting on this a little bit, and he's he's a great... Well, obviously, he's punk as hell, so it's just always interesting to hear what he's pissed off about. Um, it's... Whatever that whatever it is that reduces your your royalties, it's like ah, oh, we're not making anything anyway. It's like tenths of a penny, so who cares? We'll give them a thing, but it sucks that they do that. It sucks that they're not profitable. It sucks that they need to reduce payouts to try to become profitable rather than delight their users and have them want to pay more. I mean, ugh. it's it's kind of gross. Discovering, but money. it is. I don't know how I quite feel about it. I'm sorry. I, I that's all right. I'll, I'll do some research and, and see yeah. what happens. Cool. Very cool. Um, I just really hope it doesn't get to the point where they go, Oh, this artist chooses to use Spotify, so I'm gonna I'm gonna diss them. Cause I've encountered that a lot. Like you know Oh god. It just really fucking bakes my brain when they go, oh, I wanna I I wanna do this for a living, I wanna do this for a living and then they don't they don't realise that it's a business. And you were moving it like you think this is fucking tough. The 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 eighties, nineties, two thousands record label uh, recording industry. This is this is nice muddy coddling compared to the fuck you for the rest of your life, you know bullshit. But look, whatever. I just I'll do some research and see what it says. Um. Yeah. Um, okay, that was good. Uh, does anybody else want to talk about things that make them angry? And I'm going to try this waterfall thing, by the way. I just fucking uploaded something. I'm hey, afraid that, um, part of the appeal of landing on Ari's explanation of waterfall, which I've heard for two years, people say waterfall release, and I always didn't quite get that there was this actual accumulation thing going on with which help, helps with the metaphor. I'm afraid that it also gives you permission to um, procrastinate <laughs> a lot. But like, oh, I thought I was going to have to start releasing singles now, but no, I can just put, you know, the whole album together and put that on the... Oh, thanks, Josie. Good cat. Um, put it off for six months and, you know... I'm hoping it's, it's the opposite and it, like, is it somewhat inspirational and gives you the motivation to do some stuff, I guess, rather than putting things off. Yes. What a curiosity. So you'd call... Oh, look, I'll look into it. I really, really want to ask this question. And I also want to know, how does this... Is this aimed at other streaming services besides Spotify? Or is it trying to... Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, the... The two examples that, that he cites are how it looks in Apple and how it looks in Spotify, but it's your, what do you call them, agitators? Your agitator is part of their function is to be able to put things in the right format for all your DSPs and there's whatever the standardized format is. This works for all of them. So yeah, it's not strictly a Spotify thing, but a lot of the gamification stuff like you know being able to pitch for editorial playlists and the accumulated plays and making a difference and stuff probably is geared towards Spotify's um, machinations. So. And machinations sums it up perfectly. Okay, that's mm -hmm. really interesting. I'm going to be eating that. Um, uh, yay, I have a... Uh, Alright, cool. Who? Anybody else want to jump in about anything else here or... I'm learning. Today's the day of me learning things. Wow, dead silence. Okay. I, I would work with YouTube as well. 
Wow, everyone jumps in all of a sudden. Okay, I, uh, uh, Ivan, I'm going to throw it to you, then I'm going to throw it to Vince. I, you spoke at the same time, go. Yeah, with, I, I'm wondering if the waterfall release would, would work with, with YouTube's, you know, stuff as well. Because, uh, you know, YouTube is the number one service for actually, you know, consuming music. I don't think YouTube retains a, a sense of, of albumness, though. They'll just drop all of your single instances of songs into a playlist associated with an album. But when it goes from distro to YouTube, I don't think they get albums okay. there. That stuff changes. I know that they're 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 doing different things with um, actual music. But I, 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 my, my guess is is it, it works in that yeah the ISRC is there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for. For YouTube music, it may just it, it releases it as singles, but then it puts it in a playlist. But that playlist is the topic that is the album, so it should edit that topic playlist as it does it, essentially doing the same thing it does on other streaming services, because it gets its information from Google Play Music. Well, what used to be Google Play Music and is now YouTube Music, because Google Play Music doesn't exist anymore. Topic um, is the word I was looking for. That's that's on the nose. Yeah. But yeah, that it, it should work about the same way. It's just the way it displays it is different because it's YouTube and everything has to be in a video format because it's YouTube. So they just they put a still frame of your album cover there and just add it to that playlist that all of those have the same image on them unless it was specifically a single release with a different image. And then you may end up with more than one copy of it on YouTube. But yeah. Yeah, it should work essentially the same way. I was just saying, I have merch. Like I was, <laughs> everything went quiet. I was like, "Good, I have merch available now." Yeah, I actually got some for myself. Good on you, Vince. Shirt version of it I got because awesome. I like to stay covered as much as possible, even when I'm hot. Um, but there's also t-shirts, hoodies. Uh, this design. I don't know if I have tank tops available or not. I don't remember. I don't think so. But there's unisex tees, women's tees. I got a bunch of stuff on Teespring. Good on you. Uh, I don't know where that link is right now off the top of my head. I'd have to open up some other stuff. But, yeah, I've got uh, that. And there's still a couple of pins left and CDs on Bandcamp, too. But Excellent. Apparently, it's hard for me to sell stuff. It's hard for everyone to sell stuff, let me tell you. It's hard. Uh, and I, I would like to talk about that, but I see Rezzy's hand go. Um, well, before I go back to the, the, the T-shirts, um, is, is Rob Swords and Synthesizers on uh, YouTube? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Is Rob Swords and Synthesizers yes. on YouTube? Yes. Rob is dropping some knowledge about stats about um, the gross revenue of the music industry and how it has increased and it's uh, uh, entirely appropriate that we're talking about ways of staking our claim on it because it's huge and increasing and it is um, because of what we do <laughs> so um, are the print on demand t-shirts Vince maybe maybe this isn't a print on demand but assuming it is are, are do the print on demand screen printed t-shirts um, who work with local um manufacturers uh and good do they do good work do they look nice are they as good as uh 19 um well i ordered a hoodie and a long sleeve tee from teespring and they're they're a print on demand that's uh the hoodie came from ohio and the t-shirt came from california so they're not using local local because i'm in upstate new york but they're they're within the united states at least the hoodie came out a little crooked i actually still need to send them a thing about that like the print on it is off kilter just a tiny bit but like it doesn't look bad it looks real good so like i'm not i haven't had the motivation to really complain about it to them uh the t-shirt is amazing i mean look at the colors on it is kind of like i don't know if you've seen the album cover on Bandcamp or when i posted it but like that's that's the album cover and is that screen printed or accurate to what the album cover act I don't know the transfer method precisely. That's not screen printed. For this, I'm assuming I'm assuming they're screen printed. 
that's based not... on the, like the texture of the. No, I, I think that's is, a is digital because that's a really, really, really good uh, full color print. Yeah, the color blends say not not Zeps. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That would make sense. Okay, yeah. Well, I don't know. It 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 looks amazing. It feels good. And uh, yeah, the only issue I had was that the the one hoodie as a test thing I ordered was a printed just a tiny bit crooked, but. I'm a tiny bit crooked, so you know I really don't honestly care that much. We're all crooked, <laughs> baby. This is Picasso world. That's bloody awesome. Can I go on a rant? Thanks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say you can. So I'm doing Kickstarter, getting ready for Kickstarter for a new album, and I'm really questioning. Uh, it's interesting we're talking about merch because I'm really questioning merch and what to stock and what to offer uh, there's a lot of younger people back in the club so club wear has become a thing again um so there's that but then there's also the big question of i really want to press vinyl i really want to press tape i really want to press cds and i really want to make a usb key but the problem i've got is um i do not have the, and the fucker with vinyl is it's like okay well a hundred will cost you this much. You get a hundred done, and it, the albums it's gonna they're, they're gonna be. Excuse me, I'm pulling a number out of my bum now. Fifteen bucks each for a hundred. Fifteen dollars each. But if I want a hundred and fifty vinyls, they're gonna come in at eleven dollars each. So that's good and well if you can sell them, because if you can't sell them. That whole thing just went out. Then you're paying forty dollars per vinyl. It doesn't freaking matter. And I've got so many vinyls laying around, um, because the reality of the situation is that I will probably uh, uh, look, man. I'm not gonna lie to you. I will be flat out selling a hundred vinyls, flat out. Maybe over um, five years. Um, I have two shops I can put stuff in. If I could get four shops, I could put this. I could get a hundred and fifty. Um, so what I'm going to be trying to do is like just to be selling them like really as cheaply as I possibly can on, you know, on the initial release. Um, but then there's cassettes and cassettes is such a cool idea. And, and what's really interesting is that like the mastering plus the CDs is for me, it's going to be around about two grand, two and a half grand because I don't fuck around with my mastering. And as far as CDs goes, I'm getting the minimum CDs I can get. I think I'm only getting like 100 or 150 CDs as well. Because um, it's so fucking hard selling this shit. Um, but people want them. And I, I don't know. And then it, it, what's really interesting that if I go, well, oh, no, sorry. Uh, CDs plus mastering was about two grand. But if I go, oh, I want to add vinyl and cassette, that's just gone to four grand. Um, and the thing is that I do not know how well cassettes going to sell. I have no absolute indication of how cassettes going to sell. I know how vinyl is going to sell. Um, it will sell with a lot of trouble. I'm really revealing stuff here because people don't like talking about sales because they think that they're vulnerable and they think that they're weak by going, oh, I can't sell that many things. There's this shame about it, but come on. I'm going to tell you my experience because I don't want you wasting your money. Um, that's kind of where I am. I'm also looking at other, you know, T-shirts, obviously. I'm not going to get hoodies done because it's going to be the middle of winter, uh, summer. Um, I can't sell hoodies anyway. Um, I can't sell girl sizes of stuff. The trick with girl sizes is you print exactly the amount of girl sizes required, not a penny more, not a penny less because you won't sell them. Boy sizes, you can, you can do... Girls will buy, uh, girls will buy unisex. I should say the word unisex. Girls will buy unisex shirts. Uh, males will not buy girl shirts. Actually, some males will, and they look bloody great in them. Um, so yeah, it's just this really interesting time now where I'm going. Um, and then I have to design all the fucking merch, um, because the turnaround time on the vinyl is eleven weeks. So it'll get here. Yeah, if I if I get this out the door like really soon, it'll get here at Christmas. 
So, yeah. Um, there's that. Uh, and, and that, so that's, it's a really interesting thing that I'm, you know, I don't know how dead things are because like, you know, naturally you want to go, oh, everything's fucked. Oh, it's all fucked and it's stopped and it's dead and it's fucked, but it's not. Um, because there's more people in clubs, there's more people going out. There's more people who are, you know, band camp cassette sales are for a very, eclectic market I hate the word eclectic as soon as you say eclectic due to the um, availability and quantity of cassette decks and the plagiarism yeah um, totally man that was from Rob but the thing about it is that there's this thing called cool factor and cool factor costs you the person making this lots of money so look um because I, a band I, I'm very close with and we share numbers with, they said they went out on a three-day weekend tour and they sell forty. They sold 40 cassette tapes. So I looked at them, I looked at their sales, I looked at me, I looked at my sales, and I thought, well, maybe I can sell 50 cassette tapes over the course of X. Um, I also did something, and there are more cassette tapes decks around than, than CD players. Because cassette they takes they last longer, because CD the CD players fuck up faster. Um, yeah, I don't know. Right at this minute, I'm rethinking everything. That it, it, it's this ongoing question of like, I really like. I was gonna get the the CD just to be in a little um like just to be in an envelope, one of those like cardboard sleeves, like a little record. But then I was thinking, well, if you had all your angel spit. Like, and it was going to be in a special box with all this cool special stuff. But if you had all your Angel Spit stuff lined up, and there's the CD, that's just a... It's just in a sleeve. It falls short. Um, so there's, there's this other thing about your brand has this strength, and you need to keep hitting that strength point, not just in the quality of the music, um... Uh, but also in the quality of the branding and the merchandise as well. Um, and that is quite a challenge um, financially. And, you know, it's like with this Kickstarter, I have no idea, no idea what's going to come back. And look, man, I'll be really honest. Um, right now, considering I'm thinking about getting cuffs and necklaces and T-shirts and everything else, if I pull below seven grand, I'm going to lose. There you go. Um, my break-even point for merchandising and output on this album is going to be seven grand. Um, but I'm ordering enough merch that will yield way more than that. But this is the gamble. Oh, Vince, go. All right. When are you looking at trying to have all your merch available by? I have no idea. Um, I have no idea because it's going to be coming in different times. As soon as I send the t-shirt off, I'll have it on my door in a month. As soon as I send the CDs off, I'll have them on my door within a month, actually a few weeks. The tapes will take quite a few weeks. The vinyl, like I said, is going to be six months. Um, okay. So well, it's the thing about it is that I'll on the Kickstarter, I will probably say September release. But if you just got a, uh, a CD or a T-shirt, it will go out earlier. But it, it's going to be staggered, which is the reality of the situation. But then when you've okay. got a thing where, okay, you ordered a T-shirt and a vinyl, uh, unfortunately, that means you're going to have to pay double postage because I'm going to send you one chunk of stuff and then another chunk of stuff. Um, and I really hate doing that. Like, I hate doing that. But... That's what's going to happen. Um, so it's it's. I'm probably going to be September. Okay. If I'm lucky. Well, if you're if you're looking at you're, you're looking at possibly tapes and vinyl. Um. There's a lot of options for that. There's even print on demand options for vinyl, and it's it's expensive from what I've seen so far. I haven't found one that I like the price on to be able to do print on demand for vinyl. But. For cassette tapes, that might work out for that too. If you can find one that's not too bad, because see, here's the thing: if you're not looking at selling a whole lot of them, 
the limited quantity can increase your price point depending on just how cool that cool factor is to your audience and if you might want to do a couple of test pressings like just order a cassette or vinyl from somewhere that offers the option to do a test pressing and and or can do print on demand just in the meantime because you can usually get the test pressing done within two to three weeks and then you'd have that to know whether or not it's actually a viable option price wise and quality wise from that company that's an excellent idea um here's the things that are stopping me from doing that one here's mez um one the um the quantities I'm, I'm uh, getting at, looking at getting, uh, because one-on-one uh, -on -one printing is 20 to 30 to $40 per vinyl. Um, the quantities I'm looking at getting, like I said, I can move 100. Good to see you, mate. Um, I can move 100. Um, and uh, so I can get it. I can go to a pressing place and now be getting... A record for 15 bucks instead of 20 or 30 dollars um and that makes a massive difference because if i'm getting it for 15 bucks it means i can put it in a record shop wholesale it to a record shop and not lose money it means i can give it to them and at least it's going to be paying for the the cost of shipping or something um for a band that is not as confident for moving that sort of numbers then um sure yeah definitely get uh, print on demand because like I said um, the whole concept of saying I'm spending th these records are costing me $15 an album only comes into being in way if you sell all the records because if you don't sell all the records if you only sell 10 records they were $150 each because that's maths um so, uh, um, yeah, uh, so, so I'm, I'm reading Rob's comments. Rob, I just wish you'd jump on and talk, but, um, uh, there are really good comments going on there. Um, this is the really difficult thing about, about the business of this and the risk and the gamble of it. It's like, well, if I hedge my bets on this thing, then I can do this. And the other thing about it also is like, well, if I only get vinyl, therefore, and not tape as well, therefore, is vinyl going to become more appealing? Because if somebody's only got 40 bucks to spend, they're only going to buy the vinyl. But if they've got tape and vinyl, do you understand? Um, your... Um, yeah, people are going to enter this really ultimately at the end of the day with only so much money and you've got to be trying to figure out your fan base of, of what they can do. And and like, okay, so I'm looking at these USB keys and they're really cool keys. They've got this little code thing on it that you have to lock and unlock. Um, and maybe $20, $30. Gee, I don't know. I haven't done the sums yet. And it's going to come with the album on it, obviously. But here's the problem. Is that is that $20 or $30 that people are going to be won't be spending on vinyl now? Um, that, you know, and t-shirts are a different thing because, you know, t-shirts are five or 10 bucks and that you can have a t-shirt sitting there for a year in a safe environment where it's not getting eaten by bugs and whatever. Um, and you will sell it. And even if you end up selling it for $10, you're still going to make money. Um, because that's what it all comes down to is a product that's making money, a cool product that's making money because your audience want you to succeed. They want you to keep going and the thing that keeps you going is money. So um, that's, what's, uh, that, that's what's really hard because if you don't... Um, yeah, if you don't uh, have a situation where um, your band is financially lucrative or at least breaking even as soon as you possibly can, you're going to stop giving a fuck real quick because this is a pain in the ass because it's draining my finances. You're going to give up. Um, sorry, that was... Wow, Rezzy, go. But thank but you, don't. Vince. S sorry, what? 
You was draining your finances. Don't give up. Yeah. Trust me, it's been draining my finances for like 14 years now. I yeah. still do it. Um, uh, yeah, but you, you can't let it drain your finances. No. You, you, you well, can't. Yeah, of course, you know, don't. don't um, worry, and you, you can't, like. Love by any means, but. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, you know, if you do, it's a great way to negative gear your tax. Uh, but, um, yeah, no, no, I, I, I don't know how much Jess was in what you said. Um, but I will say in all seriousness, um, the problem that so many musicians fail or fail is the wrong word, don't meet their, what they want to do. Hashtag how many fucking musicians do I meet going, I want to do this full time. Then they don't want to have this conversation. Um, full time means money. A full time means you understand the business and you understand to a degree you understand the business. Um, and f it means that if I was to say anything to a musician that would help you, it would be work for a few years in retail and actually be the person that buys the retail, buys it, not just says, oh, hi, can I help you? No, thanks. Just looking. Everybody who works in retail will appreciate what I said. There isn't retail anymore. What am I talking about? To actually understand that you are taking a risk, a gamble, in lying out buying 10, 50 grand worth of merch for your shop or your band or whatever, hoping that that's going to turn into double or three times that amount. Um, and you want it to be three times amount because quite a few things aren't going to double they're going to lose so it's going to balance each other out um it's um yeah i don't i don't know i'm feeling a little bit embarrassed right now because now i'm talking about money and i don't like talking about money because we're not supposed to talk about money because talking about money is bad for bands but it's fine to say that we're getting ripped off all the time i'm so confused right now sorry my autism is kicking in Rezzy, do you want to speak now, please? Yeah. Um, don't feel too bad about the vinyl and numbers and money because I think I did a run of 300 and have 250 left in the closet of my last thing that I pressed. How long ago um, was that? Oh, the last thing I did was 10 years ago, the last like full-sized uh, release. But... The ones that I did sell were in handmade packaging and premium priced and stuff. So I, I don't remember how the numbers worked out, but it was an expense, not a thing. But it's that prestige thing, like you're talking about doing the um, uh, F1 racing version of your engine and also the consumer car thing. It helps. The Prius. Both. Yeah. <laughs> if, if it's yeah, if, if it's that embarrassing, maybe you could consider upgrading to a Honda. But um, the same time I was doing this, there was a really there was a company called top spin that um it was like a, a, a if you don't have a label we're gonna do all the label services automated fan direct to fan site engagement and they had a tool which um basically a spreadsheet to calculate your product blend based on percentage of sales mainstream thing so that you do a vinyl cassette uh, CD and digital and how much your costs were and how much you would be expected to sell on average of each of those so you could easily move your faders and maximize um, profit v rather than expense I'm gonna you know put in your prices for um, you know what, what your actual costs are and your likelihood of selling so you know what numbers to order on these things it's a super good tool if the spreadsheet still exists I'll pull it out and and share it I might have it stashed Top spin is just a shame they went away. Um, they got bought and disappeared like so many things. Um, but it was exactly this platform where my, the other part of what I wanted to point out is all of the angry faces that we have right now. We were talking about sequencers. Everybody had happy faces. And now we're talking about music business and we've got like, you know, this is going on to a big extent. And I feel that this is like weirdly the bad part of stuff, even though it's the part where we get to say here here's the thing i made what do you want to do give me some some thanks yeah. some money is this going to change your life in a small way and maybe worth a few bucks like that is a beautiful part of this transaction i think it would be better to give it away for free but this stuff costs so much money to operate as we've been talking about that that's kind of silly it is a business and 
as such, Carl, do you ha have an eye on all of the possible ways to drop ship and fulfill and program all this stuff? Or are you doing like 90% of the indie distro to, um, I have a black belt in, in or are you mailing. Yeah, that's me. I do all that because my background is zines. Yeah. So that's one thing I got. I mean, again, in your calculation of how much you should be getting paid to do that work, I think it should be 150 bucks, 200 bucks an hour. That would be like, you know, a living. It's not, obviously. It's not 10 bucks an hour. It's not five bucks an hour. It's whatever it ends up being. If you include the 30 hours a day you put in in the studio, there's no way to actually recoup on an hourly wage thing unless you hit the exponential hockey stick kind of growth and, and hit something big. But I'm wondering if, if, if I'm just missing it or if there is a better network of artist um, uh, joining as an independent artist to get um, uh, fulfillment services taken care of where you can drop ship more of this stuff. Because it seems like print and manufacturing on demand and logistics are better now than they've ever been, if not actually good. I don't know that they are good, but they are certainly uh, better and there are more of them than there ever have been. So is that a thing? Yes. Maz, can you hold your thought? I want to hear what you think. Um, I apologize if I'm going dark here. Uh, I, I, you might need to remind me because I want to answer that. I'm really excited about this album. I've got all this cool stuff that I'm so excited about. But as usual, it's the reality of the finances of it. Um, and it's looking at this thing going, this is going to cost me five grand, seven grand straight up. I don't have that money. And the Kickstarter is going to come in late and da 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 da. Um, but, um, but that's what it is to be a musician. And that's why I need Spotify, etc. But I'm going to stop complaining now. Um, so the answer is yes, there are places you can go to do merch fulfillment. But the problem with that is that if I do merch fulfillment, when you get your angel spit stuff in you in the mail, you will know that Carl did this. If there are fingerprints on this merch, they're my fingerprints. Um, when I am fulfilling merch and suddenly I feel so happy, when I'm doing a Kickstarter and I've got this guy's name in front of me or this person's name in front of me, I'm going, okay, this is for Louis. I'm going, Oh, Louis, thank you, man, thank you. And I, I have this feeling, in, like while I am I'm putting Louis' stuff together, I have this feeling of gratitude to Louis going to Pennsylvania. Um, and when I write on that, thank you, Louis, I mean it. And, and on, on each of those little, you know, things, that the, you'll always get a little thing from me that it's got a blurb about the album and how I had 20 nervous breakdowns and blah, blah, blah. But here it is. Thank you, Carl. I wrote that to you. Um, and every word of that I meant to you. So, and even when I'm, it's not a Kickstarter and it's just uh, someone bought something off Bandcamp, um, it's the same thing. It's like Josie in Tennessee. Thank you. Sign it my name, my fingerprints, Mordecai's cat hair, thank you. Um, I've done merch fulfillment before and I lost the connectivity with my audience. Um, and the thing about a Kickstarter and, and, and what I'm selling this is, is that so many people, I know these people. I have, I've spoken to these people online. I've met them at, at gigs. I, I know your name from the last two Kickstarters. I'll throw you in a CD um, or something. Um, so that's... And, and it's really interesting that I've just been bitching about how crap everything is. But, but you know, that's the payoff. And that's a payoff that money can't buy. Um, for me to say, thank you for being on this fucking trip with me. And for you to say, thank you for your music, it stopped me from killing myself. And for me to say, well, thank you for the support, it stopped me from killing myself too. Um, you know, this is a two-way thing. Um, that didn't answer your question. There are merch fulfillment services, but... Um, and, and it's another thing is that the, 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 the cost point of it is... Um, Oh, I really question the cost point of it. And then, see, the other thing about it is that if you buy a CD online, you don't want to pay for it. For me to sell you a CD anywhere in the United States now, right now is $3.65. That's media mail because I can't really send it anything else now. 
I can't. Um, even if it's a flat boy, even if it's a flat package through first class, um, it's still around about yeah. Check the numbers, man. Um, it's ah, oh, so I can't really give you a ten dollar CD with free shipping. Um, I could maybe do a twelve dollar CD with free shipping. Um, but but it's an expectation. Thank you, Amazon, that people want everything free. Um, and that's not happening. Um, so, uh, and the problem is with the merch fulfillment thing, that $4 has just become $10 or it's become $6 or $7. Um, if they're doing it, because it, it's another thing of them saying, well, uh, I could buy the t-shirt and the CD. Oh no, I can't afford that because of the postage. I'll just get the t-shirt. Um, fun times but you can send t-shirts me um, first class yes you can and a really cool trick with t-shirts if you're interested you know those food vacuum sealer things you know those, those plastic bags that you suck the air out of food stick your t-shirt in that suck the, the air out of it it'll squish them down and you can put that in a first class mail or send it anywhere in the USA for under $2 doesn't have uh, doesn't have um, tracking though but it's still flexible here's Eric um, Maz, that's that rant. Uh, sorry, I'm in total nervous breakdown mode because I'm just knee deep in numbers and everything. Welcome, Eric. Maz, what you got? Okay, I uh, I had an idea for you for um, for merch for like while you're getting the Kickstarter stuff together. Okay, so you know those those fridge magnets that you can with words that you can rearrange into poems. Ha! Like, what if you put Angel Spit lyrics? And people can put it on their fridge and rearrange it into stupid phrases. And well, I don't want to do that because that's secretly how I make my <laughs> 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 I cracked the code. Oh, my God. Um, I'll, I'll look into that. That's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I've seen right. that as merch before. I've I've played with those. I, I feel like it may or may not work for you. That's my input. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Hold on a minute. My, I'll, I'll make a look, uh, look into fridge ma magnet lyrics. All right. I would buy an angel's bit version. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's really cool. I appreciate. It. Thank you. Um, Eric, go. Hi, good to see you. Oh, sorry, dude, you're muted. I can unmute myself. You're there. There we go. I heard you guys talking about merch over on the YouTube channel, so I thought I'd drop in. We just set up um, a merch store um, for the first time in a couple weeks ago uh, for Spank the Nun. We actually are selling more merch than music. Who, what, um, uh, what, what are you using? So we're doing uh, Printify to create uh, the products, the t-shirts, uh, things like that. And then we're using Shopify for the store. And then we're testing, like adding some other sources that aren't uh, ship uh, printify, so we could do CDs, drop ship, and stuff. Mostly, um, we're, we like that we can do a different sourcing for Germany and the UK, and we could source separately for Australia, and we can separate source separately for Canada because that's been a big issue for us. When we're putting everything here and shipping and fulfilling everything, it's getting stuck at customs. It's taking a month. They're charging us 15, 20 bucks. But now we're paying the high like on the print on demand price, but it's now five dollars to ship it. So really, they're getting the shirt. We're giving them a free digital single or download with each one, and we're clearing about ten to fifteen bucks per item. I have some questions. Do it. Um. So also, Spotify. Do they still have the digital download thing? Um. I don't see a Spotify digital. I don't know anything about Spotify. Bandcamp. No, no, sorry, Shopify, Shopify. Shopify. They do, but I haven't tried using it. I've been doing the digital download on Bandcamp and then manually fulfilling orders from there. Uh, but go ahead. Um, Use Shopify uh, because it's free. Yeah. They're not charging your Bandcamp uh, things. There's a really uh, interesting... Um, a good Shopify is really interesting. There's this cutoff point... Um, where you go, 
at what point is it worth getting a Shopify? Because Spotify, there's so many of Pfizer's burning my mind, have teamed up with Shopify. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So um, there's a balance between, um, for example, Etsy or Bandcamp. Really, they're kind of free. You're paying a cut, but they're free. But whereas with Shopify, you're paying a monthly fee. What monthly fee are you paying? It's like 20 or $30 a month. Big difference between 20 or 30 bucks. Could you tell me what it is? Um, you go on, find it, then jump in. I'm going to finish my rent. This is actually really important. Right. Um, that when you look at the cut that Bandcamp take, uh, Vince, go. Shopify is $30 a month. I've been researching That's it. For yeah. myself okay. for a while. It's $30 so a month. You've got that $30 a month there. Um, on Bandcamp, who I think take 15%. Uh, that yeah. equates to three hundred. Is that two hundred? Two hundred bucks worth of um, sales a month on Bandcamp. Yeah, and we're doing um, more than that, so um, it's better. Hold on, good for you. Hold on, let me. Um, the um, the thing about it is that um, there's a there's a point of 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 weighing where Spotify, uh, Shopify becomes. Um, uh, it, it becomes viable. The problem with Shopify uh, is that the um, in music stuff comes in waves, um, and there's a wave. Then it goes. Actually, with everything, it's this wave thing. So for this period of time, that might be three months, two months, a month, four months, something, whatever. Um, it goes. Um, you have to offset that against the other time when it's in a lull. Um, And I actually stopped, I had a Shopify 10 years ago and sold digitals on it. Um, Had everything digital on Shopify and I'd say definitely do it because, you know, it's a free digital download. Um, uh, The problem was that in that lull time, everything was offset because in that lull time, I sell nothing or close to nothing. And then when the wave kicks back in, you're selling really well. And for me, it came down to, um, uh, it's just something to be noticed about with with Shopify. Um, Although it's really interesting that, are you tracking how many sales are coming off Spotify and affiliates of how many are? Yes. What percentage, what percentage? Don't talk to me about money or numbers. What percentage? most of them are it's like 80 percent come off spotify interesting yeah We're, most of it was Bandcamp, but we've been trying to move them to spotify the last three or four weeks shopify well spotify to shopify so we have a store on spotify and we're and we're attaching the spotify like singles so like if they pick a dominate the dominate shirt will pop up next to it when they and then they can click on that so we're trying to get more sales to go through the Spotify channel, which then goes to Shopify, then goes to Printify. The other way is tagging them in Instagram and Facebook through those stores, and then those go back through Shopify. We haven't, we've only got one or two through those so far, um, but the Bandcamp ones, we manually take them out of Bandcamp and then put them back over into Shopify. And yeah, we get we lose that fifteen percent on the on the Bandcamp too. Wow, double dip. Didn't even think of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, check out the digitals because like that's an area where uh, Spotify, Shopify, the shopping cart of Fi yep. um, yeah. can stand to actually um, make money back. Um, but that's interesting. Keep me posted on that. Like as the time goes by and, and, and track the ebbs and flows okay. because that's... Um, that's that's a that's a curious one. Well, one thing I was going to add, um, and I missed the beginning conversation, is I'm trying. I'm taking it as like it's not just like the the music related. I'm trying to create stuff that's just kind of brand related, and and so people want to buy stuff without having those big ebb and flows. That's kind of my goal here. So to have other things, you know, lines of shirts or other merch. Awesome. Very awesome. Rezzy, I like I see the shirt you're wearing. What, cool um, shirt. what does Shopify actually offer over, say, WooCommerce or Roll Your Own? Like, why do they exist? 
I can answer that. You want me to answer? Anyway, yeah, sure. yeah. You take it. So uh, I don't know what those other ones are, but Shopify is basically the merch store that allows you to connect to uh, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, and a few others, and it lets you set up a store independently. That's all. I, that's all. When you say I, connect, they have like widget plugins that'll work within Facebook's yep. auspices. Okay, so that's something. Um, WooCommerce is the um, the one that most people use with WordPress, and I wasn't aware that they mm. cost anything beyond the merchant processor. Um, there's no monthly. I, I thought I've used it for a couple of different projects, but. Um, and also roll your own. I just meant putting a picture of a shirt on a page and saying, buy this and having that go to um, whatever your merchant processor is, PayPal, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but Shopify cart integration with big Facebooks and stuff. Yeah, and Shop Shopify is that merchant for you when you use Shopify. They also do the merchant processor, the credit card processor. Right. Yeah, they do yeah. that whole part. Yeah. Which is starts, you know, as long as they're not taking an extra 6% on the above the $30 fee or 15% that they're, well, we've talked about a lot of fees here and I've lost track, but it's, it's, there's always fees. Um, there's an interesting thing. This may have changed with Shopify as well, is that the actual, um, the, the inner audience reach as in, you know, how Bandcamp has got, um, an engine in it that will go, Hey, you like this, you might like this too. Um, that's a really good thing about Bandcamp yeah. is that it will push it will push stuff your way and it doesn't cost you anything. Um, Etsy is actually amazing at that as well. Um, and if your stuff is more Etsy orientated, like mm -hmm. stay Etsy because it's, um, it's really uh, solid as far as it's, it's ability to push stuff out. Um, that was one thing about Shopify that um, although it's, it can plug itself into um, a lot more different, uh, uh, you know, uh, things like, you know, Spotify and, and YouTube and stuff. Um, one thing I noticed is that it didn't cross uh, pollinate, but, you know, maybe it can cross pollinate better because it's attaching itself to social media platforms that are all about cross-pollinating. I don't know. I will probably be starting one. What are your thoughts on Ko-Fi? Um, I don't have any thoughts on Ko-Fi at all because Ko-Fi is so... Um, Ko-Fi has very little connectivity um, because really what you want something is, is a, a, a thing that's going to be telling everyone about your thing. Instead of you constantly pushing social media, you want something that's going to do the job for you. Um, and, you know, that's a really good thing about Shopify, about Etsy, about Bandcamp. And I like Bandcamp Fridays have transformed, uh, have changed everything. Um, like they're really, really good. And they, there's a whole bunch of cross pollination. I get sales often from Bandcamp saying, Oh, because this person found out about your music. They don't know about your music, but it's because of band camps. We're telling people about your releases. But a bomb. It came up in their feed. I don't think Ko-Fi does that. Um, and Roll Your Own doesn't do that. Um, it comes to, you know, putting your eggs in one basket. And I will probably be looking at um, uh, getting a, um, a Shopify, um, like, hitting this album again just to see how it goes with uh, Spotify and all that jazz to test it. Um, it's kind of time. And uh, unless anybody has anything really hardcore to talk about, um, I, th I think I want to get Diana to raid on over to MTV TV. Eric, I see your hand. We're out of time. I'll, I'll, say, one, I'll say one last thing. If you guys do start getting into Printify and all of that, I recommend ordering one or two to test it before you send it to people because I picked some horrible choices on those things. Definitely test everything you're selling to people. And people like cotton. Soft. They Soft. don't like they don't like plastic. They like cotton. Um unfortunately Printify Oh, just some of the stuff I've got from Printify. It's like I can't sell this, I can't use it. 
Um, but anyway, yes, thank you. And this is another huge conversation to have at some point. Um, I thank you all for being part of this. Um, you rock. Uh, Diana, let's raid. Let's raid right now. Let's go to MTV TV because it's, it's the greatest thing in the world. And I'll, um, I'm going to put up the link to MTV TV just in case. Hey, and by the way, I should probably, um, uh, wait, it's coming. Every Saturday we're here unless I have booby trap work. And if you're ever bored and you want to throw me a couple of bucks, Angel Spits Patreon keeps the madness going. But for now, we are going to MTV TV because they're awesome. Um, we got to keep that going. So Diana's going to raid and I'm going to raid and we're going to say thank you so much for being part of this. You rock. Bye. 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 Bye.